Chapter 39 Gerunds and Gerundids Chapter 39 covers the following, the formation and use of gerunds and gerundives, and the two different forms of gerundive purpose constructions. At the end of the lesson, we'll review the vocabulary which you should memorize in this chapter. There are four important rules to remember in this chapter. Rule 1. Gerunds are verbal nouns. Gerundives are verbal adjectives. Rule 2. Gerunds and gerundives are formed like future passive participles. Rule 3. Where English will use a gerund followed by an object, Latin will use a gerundive modifying a noun. Rule 4. There are two types of gerundive purpose constructions. One, odd, plus an accusative noun, plus an accusative gerundive. Two, a genitive noun, plus a genitive gerundive, plus causa. Gerunds are verbal nouns, that is, nouns built on a verb base. They're the noun equivalent of participles, verbal adjectives. English forms gerunds by adding ing to a verb base, for instance, seeing or believing, as in seeing is believing. The underlying sense of seeing and believing in that sentence is the act of seeing and the act of believing. Note that ing can turn an English verb base into a gerund, a noun, or a participle, an adjective. Only in context is it possible to distinguish between these ing forms. So, for instance, the only thing that matters is thinking, that is, the act of thinking, a gerund, a noun, says the thinking man. This thinking is a participle, an adjective. The difference between gerunds and participles is not hard to determine. If the ing word modifies a noun, it's a participle. But if you can put the words the act of in front of the ing word, it's a gerund. It would be so nice if English didn't form gerunds and participles the same way, but it does. Latin, like the logical language it is, doesn't. Latin gerunds are formed by taking the present base plus the thematic vowel, adding nd and first second declension neuter singular endings. For example, widendum meaning seeing, or the act of seeing, or credendum, meaning believing, or the act of believing. Gerunds have no masculine or feminine forms, and no plural, how many seeings do you need to make a believing. Having only one gender and one number means gerunds can only change form through the five cases, but they don't even do that much. Gerunds have only four forms, there's no nominative ND-based gerund. When Romans needed a nominative gerund, as the subject of a sentence, for instance, they used the present infinitive instead. English can do the same. For instance, to live well is the best revenge. There, the infinitive to live is the subject of the sentence. But English can also say living well, the nominative gerund, is the best revenge. Thus, we have two nominative gerunds, two ways of saying or to say the same thing. The infinitive variant, to live well, is the only way the Romans had of expressing this sentiment in the nominative, because there was no nominative gerund in Latin, no counterpart of the English living well. Here's a chart showing how the Latin gerund is formed. The nominative uses the infinitive, the genitive ends nd, the dative endo, the accusative endum, and the ablative endo, the translations of which are obvious. To verb, which is used in place of the missing nominative verbing, of verbing, to verbing, and so on. Here's an example of a Latin gerund declined in the oblique cases, that is, from genitive to ablative. Amandi, Amando, amandum, amando, meaning of loving, to or for loving, loving as direct object or object of certain prepositions, by, with, or from loving. These are used in contexts like the science of loving, 
the need for loving. We all need loving. And by loving, we make the world a better place. As we just noted, those are all the forms of the ND-based gerund Latin has. Four forms total. And only three different endings total. E, um, and o. Oh. So there's actually a big difference between the way the gerund and the gerundive look. The gerundive, you will remember, is the form used in passive periphrastics. If the ND is followed by any first second declension ending other than E, um, or O, oh, and da, and die, and dom, and dos, and das, the form is a gerundive, not the gerund. Thus, the potential for confusing gerunds and gerundives is, in practice, really quite small. One major use of gerunds in Latin is in the ablative case, where they often serve as ablatives of means, that is, by verbing, by trying, by helping, by hurting, by healing. In fact, when you see a verb form ending endo with no preposition in front of it, the first translation you should try is by whatever the verb is ing. By doing that, you will most often succeed. Every chapter in Wheelock has a catch, doesn't it? Surely you've caught on to that by now? Well, here's the curveball in chapter 39. I'm going to say this first in simple terms, and then we'll talk about the bizarre and far-reaching consequences of this catch 39. Here it is in a nutshell. Latin gerunds don't take objects. Well, not in the classical age. In earlier Latin they did, but since this course is addressing the way Cicero and Virgil spoke, and those authors don't ever attach objects to gerunds, this is a rule as far as we're concerned. Let's start by looking at this catch from the English perspective. When we use love as a noun, it can't take an object. Love each other is all that matters. That makes no sense. The noun love can't take an object like each other. You can, of course, put an of after love, love of each other, but then you don't have an object. You have an objective genitive. That's a totally different thing. But watch this. Turn love into a gerund, loving, and now you can have an object. Loving each other is all that matters. English gerunds can take objects. Latin gerunds can't. Why? Hard to say. Apparently the Romans didn't see the gerund as having enough verb in it to be able to take an object. They saw it as a noun. So in the same way we can't put each other directly after the noun love, the Romans didn't hear enough verb sense in amandum, for instance, to give it an object. To them it didn't sound like loving, but lovingness and you can't attach an accusative direct object to lovingness. So what did the Romans do when they wanted to express the object of the verbal quality in the gerund? Are you sitting down? This is really odd, and it'll take you a moment to wrap your head around this, but it's not hard, just weird. Really weird. <sighs> Here goes. When Romans wanted to add an object to a gerund, they turned the gerund into a gerundive. Gerundives, you remember, are participles, verbal adjectives, not nouns. Quick review. Gerundives use the same base as gerunds, nd plus first second declension endings, and have the sense about or going to be whatever the verb is. English has nothing corresponding to Latin gerundives. The closest thing we have is to be whatever, which, like gerundives, can convey a sense of necessity or obligation. It is to be. It must be. Combine that with a form of esse, and you get the passive periphrastic. For example, agendum est. It must be done. Now, back to gerunds versus gerundives. Unlike gerunds, gerundives aren't nouns. They're adjectives. They modify nouns, and technically, that's all they ever do in Latin. Even in a passive periphrastic, they're not actually the verb. The form of esse attached to them is. Instead, gerundives being adjectives modify something. In a passive periphrastic, the subject. 
In the example I just cited, agendum est, agendum is neuter singular because the subject is it. That's the heart of this problem here, the adjectival nature of gerundives. So far, the only way we've seen gerundives used in Latin is in passive periphrastics. But here comes some bad news. That's not their only use. Sometimes they aren't connected with the verb to be. Sometimes they're just used as adjectives modifying nouns. And when that happens, they lose their sense of necessity and aren't translated as must be. And now here's the crux of the issue. The Romans used gerundives where we would use a gerund plus an object. In other words, where we say, he saved us all by averting those dangers, averting is a gerund, and those dangers is its object. But since Latin can't attach an object to a gerund, the Romans rephrased the thought as, he saved us all by or through those dangers to be averted. That is, which were averted. To be averted is a gerundive. I can hear the screaming from here. Give me a second and I'll show you how easy it is to handle this construction, even if understanding it is next to impossible. Okay, are you sitting down again? Good, let's move on. Let's start by looking at how this construction would sound in English, if English were so foolish as to have it. Here's an example of a noun and a gerundive acting like a gerund with an object. Where the literal English would be, in the deed to be done, to be done, which is the closest thing English has to the Latin gerundive, is an adjective modifying the noun deed. In Latin, that would be, in facto, in the deed, agendo, to be done. The gerundive agendo modifies the noun facto. But if you look at the sense, the deed is receiving the action of doing. The participle is passive, so its subject, the noun it modifies, receives its action. Thus, in the deed to be done is the equivalent of saying, in doing the deed. There, doing is a gerund, a verbal noun, with an object, deed. English can say it that way, gerund plus object, because we English speakers hear enough verbal quality in our gerunds to allow them to take objects. Apparently, Latin gerunds didn't sound verby enough to the Romans for their gerunds to do the same, which necessitated the bizarre gerundive workaround we just looked at. Hmm, I'm guessing this is making less and less sense as I keep talking. So I'm going to stop trying to explain this perverse grammatical concoction and instead just show you how to deal with it. When it all comes down to passing this class, all you have to do here is know how to handle this idiom. You don't have to understand it. Here's how to tame this beast. Think of the Latin as backwards English. In Latin, the gerundive is grammatically dependent on the noun, just as all adjectives are dependent on nouns. The noun will have a case, and number and gender, to which the adjective must conform. For instance, of this to be done. There, of is the case, this is the noun, and to be done is the gerundive, the adjective. English has none of this nonsense. We say, of doing this. No passive gerundive workaround. So, extract the passive verb sense done from to be done, make it active, do, and turn the noun the gerundive agrees with into that verb's object. In other words, take of this to be done, put do in front of this, and add ing. It's that simple. You basically flip the verb and noun around, add ing, and move on. Let's practice that, this time turning the process around and looking at it in Latin first and how you translate this construction into reasonable English. Cupidus amandi means desirous of loving, the act of loving. Cupidus, meaning desirous, is in the vocabulary for this chapter, which we'll discuss later.
This adjective takes a genitive after it, like a mandi, a gerund in the genitive case. It has no object, so there's no problem. But add an object, and Latin can't use the gerund anymore. Say you want to say, desirous of loving girls. Now, loving can't be a gerund in Latin. It has to be a gerundive modifying what in English is the object of the gerund. In other words, loving has to modify girls, and girls has to take the case the Latin gerund had, the genitive. It becomes cupidus puellarum amandarum, literally, of the girls to be loved, that is, who are to be loved. But forget the literal meaning. It makes no sense in English. Just look at what you did. You took the love out of Amandarum and turned it into a gerund, loving, the act of loving, then made girls its object and put the of, the case of Puellarum, on the front of the English gerund. So to create the English translation, you inverted the grammatical relationship of the words in Latin, turning of girls to be loved into of loving girls. Let's look at another example. Propter metuendum means because of fearing. Metuendum is an accusative gerund, accusative because it's the object of the preposition propter. No problem until you add an object, like hostes. Then things get ugly. Latin can't metuendum hostases. Metuendum needs to be turned into a gerundive, an adjective modifying hostes. Propter hostes metuendos. Metuendos is now accusative plural masculine to agree with hostes. The literal translation, because of the enemy to be feared, is really no help in figuring out what this means. What this phrase really means in English is because of fearing the enemy. So instead of reading the construction in the order noun and verb, enemy plus fear, that's the way Latin does it, flip the noun and verb around and say fear plus enemy. Add ing to the verb and you get because of fearing the enemy. Got it? Don't overthink it. Here's all you need to do. You see an ND form. There's no SE, so this isn't a passive periphrastic. Find the noun the ND form agrees with and make that noun its object. What you've done grammatically is convert the ND form, the equivalent of ing in English, from a gerundive attached to a noun into a gerund plus an object. But you don't have to understand all that grammar to manage this construction. All you have to know is how to do these four steps. 1. Take the English verb sense out of the ND form. 2. Add ing. 3. Put that ing thing into the same case and construction as the Latin noun to which the gerundive's attached. And 4. Make the noun the ing thing's object. That's it. You're done. Think you can do it? Let's see. In bello gerendo, bello means war. Gerendo comes from the verb gero, which means wage. So literally, this monstrosity says, in the war to be waged. But that's not even half-decent English. Forget it. Instead, take wage, add in to the front of it, and ing to the back of it, make war the object, and it becomes in waging the war. Waging is now a gerund with an object, war. How about de urbibus delendis? What's the noun? Urbs, meaning city. What's the verb? Deleo, what's its basic English sense? Destroy. What does de mean? About, on the subject of. So, take the verb sense destroy, put about in front of it, ing after it, attach cities as the object, and you get about destroying the cities. We'll practice gerundives more at the end of the lesson, but first we need to look at one of their most important applications, the gerundive purpose construction. I should say constructions, 
because Latin has two gerundive purpose constructions, very different looking, but closely related grammatically. One uses the preposition ad plus an accusative noun plus an accusative gerundive, meaning literally and nonsensically, to or toward the noun to be gerundived. For instance, to or toward this goal to be achieved. Use the reverse the noun and verb rule we just discussed above, and you will get the much better English toward achieving this goal, the equivalent of a purpose construction, to achieve this goal. The other gerundive purpose construction uses a genitive noun plus a genitive gerundive plus causa, meaning for the sake of, literally, for the sake of this goal to be achieved. What would that be in real English? Apply the reverse the noun and verb rule and you get for the sake of achieving this goal. Really just another way of saying to achieve this goal. Let's look at examples of both constructions in Latin. I'll give you the Latin in its gerundive form. You give me the normal way of saying this in English. First, ad urbem opugnandam. Opugno means attack. I'll introduce it in the vocabulary below. Take the sense attack out of opugnandam. Put to or in order to on the front. You don't need ing here because in English an infinitive shows purpose. And make the noun urbem the object of opugno. And you get to or in order to attack the city. See the pattern? Let's try another gerperp. I'm tired of saying gerundive purpose construction. Gerperp will be our abbreviation. Ad veritatem loquendam, meaning to or in order to do what verb? To what noun? That's right. To speak loqua the truth. Veritatem. One more. Ad quitatem defendendam. To protect, defend, the state, kiwitatem. Okay, one more. Ad consules interficiendos. To kill the consuls. One more, just one more. Ad wokem oratoris audiendam. To hear the voice of the speaker, or the speaker's voice. Notice the ending on audiendam, accusative singular feminine. That's because the gerundive is an adjective agreeing with wokem. Literally, it's the voice, not the speaker, that's being heard here. In the top example on this page, interficiendos does the same. It's accusative plural masculine to go with consules. Note that in this variation of the gerperp, the ending on the gerundive will always be accusative because the whole construction is being governed by ad. The lesson here is, when you're composing this type of gerperp in Latin, remember to make the gerundive accusative, and whatever gender and number the noun is. Now let's look at some examples of the other type of gerperp, the one that uses causa, and will always have nouns and gerundives with genitive endings, like militum hortandorum Causa. How would you translate that into semi-reasonable English? That's right. For the sake of encouraging the soldiers. Meaning, to encourage the soldiers. How about, weeni ferendi causa? Yeah, for the sake of bringing the wine. In other words, to bring the wine. And, exilii vitandi causa for the sake of avoiding exile, to avoid exile. Navium capiendarum causa, to capture the ships. And finally, solus videndi causa, to see the sun. And I think you see the light, even if it doesn't make completely perfect sense. This is all you need to know. In Latin, a noun to be verbed equals English verbing a noun. And now it's time for us to be moved along. That is, to move us along. 
to the vocabulary. The first word is idificium idificii neuter, meaning building or structure. It's a second declension noun, a combination of two bases, eith, meaning hearth, and thic, meaning make. So to the Romans, an idificium was at heart a place that had a hearth. Heating and cooking systems are still considered essential in housing. The ith base derives from an Indo-European root that means burn, which is seen in other classical derivatives like Ethiopia, literally the land of the burnt, ith, faced, op, people, which is how ancient Greeks saw Africans. Also from the ith base is ether, or ether, which to the ancient Greeks meant the upper atmosphere, literally the burn, probably a reference to the brightness of light at high altitudes. The thin air up there no doubt also gave rise to the theory that there was an element called ether, which permeated space. In the modern era, when a volatile compound was discovered that fit the imagined properties of that element, it was called ether. Later, ether was discovered to have anesthetic properties and used to put people to sleep during surgery. The idea that ether is a high atmosphere gas can still be heard in our adjective ethereal, meaning light or airy, and in the phrase in the ether, an early reference to radio, and from there to computing and the ethernet. The next word is injuria, injuriae, feminine, meaning injustice, injury, or wrong, a first declension feminine noun. It's a compound of the prefix in, meaning not, and the base your, meaning law or right, making it literally lawlessness. The next word is wox, wokis, feminine, meaning voice or word, a third declension feminine noun, which is not I stem, only one consonant at the end of the base. What is its ablative singular? Good, woke. And how would Latin say, in a great voice? What use of the ablative is that? What does it show? The manner in which someone was speaking. Does the ablative of manner require a preposition? Yes, cum, but it's optional if there's an adjective attached to the noun. So, magna woke, or magna cum woke. The next word is an adjective, cupidus a um, meaning desirous, eager, or fond. It's first second declension. It expects a genitive after it, just like its English counterpart, fond. Next is nekese, an indeclinable adjective, used only in places where the nominative or accusative is called for, and only ever with the verbs esse and habere, habere in its mental sense consider. In other words, nekese can only be used to say be necessary or consider necessary. This limited application does not, however, equate to limited use. It's actually seen quite often in Latin, especially in the expression necesse est, it is necessary, or some tense variation thereof. Necesse est expects a dative and an infinitive. It is necessary for someone to do something, or a subjunctive verb, with or without an ut, basically the same expectations that licet and opus est have. The next word is another third declension adjective, wetus veteris, meaning old. It belongs to the wooden termination variety, like potens, potentis, or any present participle, where the base becomes visible only after the nominative. What then is the base of wetus? Yes, wetter. And there's an annoying feature of this adjective. It's not I stem, as you'd expect, since it's third declension. So, what's its ablative singular, then? Good, wetere. And its neuter, nominative, or accusative plural? Wetera, meaning old things. How about of old things? How would you say that in Latin? Uh-huh. Wetterum. 
Next up is etsy, a subordinating conjunction that means even if. Remember that et doesn't just mean and, it can also mean even. Et tu, Brute? Even you, Brutus? After that is quasi, meaning as if. Another subordinating conjunction or adverb. And I'll answer your question before you ask it. Yes, this is where Quasimodo, the character from The Hunchback of Notre Dame, gets his name. According to Hugo's story, he was abandoned as a deformed baby on the steps of the famous cathedral in Paris, where a priest found and raised him. Naming him after the first word of the prayer for that day, the Sunday after Easter, a prayer that begins, Quasimodo, Geniti Infantes, meaning, just like newborn babies. <laughs> Hugo's imagination was as deformed as his protagonist. The next word is Experior Experiri Expertus Sum, a fourth conjugation deponent verb meaning try, test, or experience. The pair in this verb is not the Latin prefix through, but a base that means trial or test, literally pass across a boundary. You've seen it before in periculum, danger, literally a little test or trial of one's fortitude, I suppose. It's also seen in the Greek word emporos, meaning merchant, which gives us the word emporium, a store that sells imported goods. So originally in Greek, traders were merchants, emporoi, who bought and sold goods across international boundaries. And finally, the last word on this vocabulary list is opugno, first conjugation, meaning attack or assail. Literally, it's ob, meaning face-to-face, -face, plus pugno, fight. That is, fight in close quarters. From that, it gets one of its most common uses in Latin, to besiege. After all, at some point during a siege, the fighting has to happen face to face. Do the rules that were cited at the beginning of this chapter now make sense to you? If not, please review this presentation. If so, please proceed to the next slide. For the next class meeting, please bring in a copy of the Practice and Review Sentences for Chapter 39 on page 189 of Wheelock's text. As promised, here are some Latin sentences with gerunds and gerundives for you to practice translating these constructions. I've set this exercise to the accompaniment of some lovely music with Latin lyrics, the recordare of Mozart's famous Requiem Mass. As you go through these, I'll give you time to work out the translation of each sentence, starting with this one. <laughs> 